Hey folks, welcome back to another review with yours truly, Sam Healy. Today we're taking a look at this, the reprint of Cartagena from Leo Colavini, uh, published by Rio Grande Games. And basically it is exactly what I just said, it's a reprint, but it's a, a, a combining of Cartagena and Cartagena 2, basically. There's some changes even between uh, Cartagena 2 and this, but generally speaking, the base game plays exactly the same as what you're used to, probably, if you've played Cartagena before. Um, but there are some other variant rules in there that you can throw in to spice up the mix a little bit. Let's get down to the table, and I'll show you. So here I have a four player game of Cartagena set up for you and this is just the basic game where you have a group of pirates that are prisoners and they are trying to escape prison and make it to their boat there at the end of the track at which point they have escaped to freedom and they are ready to have fun. The basic gist is that players are competing to get all six of their pirates into the boat first. The first player to do that is the winner of the game. Now, the way that you move your pirates along the track is by playing cards out of your hand. Your cards have these different symbols on them, and some of them are light-colored backgrounds, and some of them are dark backgrounds. And we'll get to that in just a few moments. That's for one of the uh, personalization rules that you can add to the game if you want to spice it up a little bit. But generally speaking, you play a card from your hand. So if you play, a, for example, this treasure chest card and I am red, I would be able to move one of my red pirates along the track until they meet a uh, unoccupied treasure chest. And then he is done. I can play one to three actions on my turn. The second action could be to play something like, oh, I don't know, uh, maybe I want to play this cup. Now, I can use that to either um, move one of my guys from here to this cup, which is the first unoccupied position for him, or I can not move him out and move this guy to the next cup position on the track that is unoccupied. So that is how you move your pirates along the track using the cards. At some point, you may need to draw more cards. And the way you draw cards is by moving one of your guys back to a space that is already occupied by another pirate, whether it's your pirate or somebody else's. And when you do that, you can draw a number of cards equal to the number of pirates that are on the space that you stop, not including your own. So in this case, I would be able to draw one card and be done. But let's say that I was able to, I had another pirate out here somewhere, and then on my second action, I could move him back and then draw two cards because there are two other pirates in that location. Uh, not including my own, so I'd be able to draw two in that case. So that is how you are able to draw cards into your hand during the course of the round. Now, during the course of the game, as more spaces get filled up on the track, you may be able to play some cards that will get you uh, a good spot with uh, a good length of the path with just one play. For example, if I played uh, my a treasure chest here, I would be able to go along the track until I find an empty uh, track, which is way up here. So as you can see, as places get filled up, a couple of things you have to keep track of is, am I covering up all of the spaces of one kind of card type which will allow somebody to really jump ahead here or am uh, I am trying to uh, watch for things like that that other people are covering up so maybe I want to save these cards and play them when it's more advantageous there's a number of different things for you to do here and that's the basic gist of the game moving your pirates along the path using uh, the cards that are in your hand when you start to get low moving them back into groups of other pirates, uh, either one or two, so that you can draw one or two cards on your turn. It is of note at this point though, that if there's ever uh, one space that has three pirates in it, you cannot come back and join them and then draw three cards. You would have to skip over them, come back, oh, there's another group, and back to here, 
and then you'd only get to draw one card. Uh, all, three pirates is the maximum number of pirates that can ever be on one space. Now there are certain kinds of personalized rules that allow you to change how the game is played. The first one is the Morgan rule, and basically what that says is that it replaces the moving backwards to draw a card. Instead of moving one of your pawns backwards, the Morgan rule says that you can move one of your opponent's um, meeples forward on the track and then draw for the number of pirates that occupy that position, not including the one that was moved. So that's uh, kind of changes the game a lot, makes it go probably a little bit faster, but that's a rule that you can substitute to try to make it feel a little bit different after a while. Then if you want to just make it a shorter game, you could simply just limit the number of um, tiles that are used to create the board. That will shorten the game because you have a shorter uh, racetrack, so to speak. You could also play on the other side of these maps and make it so that you're racing along an island. Maybe you don't like the prison, escaping prison theme. You can make it to where you're racing towards an island, so you're leaving your hideout and going to the boat or vice versa. Uh, you can also play it where you, um, it's called the whole jailbreak, where you play one game where you were breaking out of prison and getting to the boat and then you automatically go to another set um, where you're uh, you're landing on your your hideout island and trying to get to your hideout first and then you have two other um, rules that you can either use or not use the one is called filibusters filibusters is that uh, you you usually have a hand limit of seven cards and filibusters gives you the opportunity to break that rule but if you do um if you do find yourself to have more than seven cards in your hand when somebody plays one of the dark background cards then you will have to discard down to seven so it's kind of like a push your luck mechanism but it also um kind of helps guard against people who might be hoarding the different kinds of item cards that are in their hand. And then finally, there's a Black Magic Woman uh, variant that you can put in there. And I'm saying exactly what it is. It's called the Black Magic Woman variant. Uh, so this is the uh, probably one of the most recent changes to the game uh, that has been done. And it utilizes these car these tokens right here that will be shuffled before the game begins and placed on all of the different treasure spots that are on the board now when you reach one of those spots you simply turn it over and it says what you get for example this one allows you to draw two cards um, this one uh, allows you to draw only one card and then there are some on here that don't have anything at all. Maybe it's this one right here. It's absolutely empty. And then there's also one that is a snake and you get bitten by a snake. So when you land on one of these that has a card, you simply do that. You draw a card. If you land on one with a snake, however, you have to move your pawn back to the nearest rum section so that uh you know basically he's 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 so freaked out he needs to go get a drink or something to that effect if there are no pawn uh if there are no spots available uh of rum something to this effect then you have to move your guy back to the last space on the track um, and once the snake is found, these tokens are taken and then shuffled and then placed back out onto the board. Now, on top of that, another thing that happens is that all of these different symbols have special powers to them. So if you play a gun, whether it's a dark bordered or, or I'm sorry, a dark background or a light background, you can look at one opponent's cards and then pick one of your choice. And then your opponent immediately draws a replacement from the top of the deck. If you play a rum card, one of these guys, then everybody gets a drink. You draw as many cards from the top of the deck as there are players, plus one. You get to choose two, and then everybody else gets to choose one. If you play a lantern, then the, you draw four cards, keep one of them for you, and then you place the other three on top of the deck in any order that you choose. Uh, parrots can be played uh, two at a time, 
as a wild. So you can play two parrots at the same time and it can be any symbol that you want it to be. You can play hooks and hooks can be played with other cards uh, to be moved to the same space. But the caveat is, is that they all both have to be in the same spot. So if I played uh, these two together, I could take these two guys and move them both to that parrot symbol like so. And that uh, when, whenever you uh, play, we already kind of talked about this, but whenever you play treasure chests and you move your guy onto a treasure chest, then you're going to be getting one of these tokens uh, and either getting the, a good effect or a bad effect or no effect. Uh, so that's generally how it is. This is basically a conglomeration of both Cartagena and Cartagena 2 uh, as far as all of the rules that come in the box. So let's get to my final thoughts. So there you have it. That is Cartagena with all of its extra rules and all that kind of stuff added into it. Um, now, I play this game a good bit and I've, I've come to the realization that I think this game is, is slightly a bit longer than it needs to be for what it is. And I think all of the other rules that get added to it, while they're interesting and uh, they seem like they would spice up the game a little bit. Um, sometimes make the game goes a little bit faster. That's good um, because I found that at a certain point and usually it, that point is reached at different times for different groups of people, uh, it just becomes a chore um, because you're so close to finishing but I'm not drawing the cards that I need to draw and I keep just I just keep moving backwards and backwards and if I'm using the Morgan rule I'm just moving other people forwards and faster and I'm not advancing my own agenda here at all. There's just this point, a saturation level, I guess you could say, with the game where, okay, I just want the game to be over with. And I know it's not going to be over with for another 10 minutes at least. So that's problematic when a game uh, fosters that kind of response from the people that's playing it. Usually, at least for me, I want a game that's going to envelop uh, my mind and kind of take over to where I, I don't realize how fast time is passing. Uh, where I'm, we're done with the game and I look at my watch and I go, wow, we were playing the game that long? Didn't feel like that at all. Well, this one has the other effect. Wow, we played this 20 minutes longer than the box says we should have been playing it. Did we do something wrong? No. Wow, it just played longer. <laughs> so that's the kind of feeling that Cartagena gave me after we played it a few times. And I, I, I did play it originally way back when, but um, and as I was playing it again with this new version, I was reminded about my original thoughts on it. And it was simply that this game just seems too long for what it is. I, I want it to be faster. And you can use fewer tiles uh, as you're making up the, the track that you're going to be following to make it shorter. So I, there is that. There is that caveat that it doesn't have to be as long as it is, you can shorten it. Um, so there's that. The other thing is uh, moving people forward instead of moving people, moving yourself backward. That will also speed up the game because you're you're helping other people basically. Um, so there's that. Um, using the different um, rules, for example, the the Black Magic Woman rules, where you have all of your cards have special abilities. That will help things move along a little bit faster as well because they're special abilities that let you move further quicker and get more cards into your hand. Those treasure card tiles, while it's kind of a uh, push your luck type mechanism where you don't want to land on that snake and get sent back, uh, but you land on some of the other ones, you can get anywhere from one to three cards in that. So uh, there, there, uh, there's some good stuff here. I just don't think it's enough, at least for me, to put it over the top on and be a game that I'm going to pull off uh, willingly from my shelves and say, hey, let's play this again. Uh, now, with that being said, if somebody wants to play Cartagena and I'm in that group, then sure, let's go ahead and do it. So I, I don't have an aversion to it, but I, I don't, I'm not going to choose it, I guess you could say. So I, I really feel like this is just kind of a middle of the road kind of game for me. It, it doesn't really shine but it's not really dim either. I think it's it's okay. It's just not great. It's definitely not bad. Uh, it's just kind of, eh. And unfortunately, that's a bad thing in our, in our society, uh, in our gaming hobby right now, because if a game is just, meh, nah, 
then it doesn't really have any staying power. It has to have some oomph. It has to have some draw to it. So with all that being said, I think that this is a, a neat uh, evolution of the game. I just don't think that it has evolved enough to really garner my attention. As I always say though, try before you buy because it is entirely possible that you will entirely disagree with me. So there is always that. So go give it a whirl, see what you think, and we'll see you guys on the flip side.